Welcome viewers. If you are new here, I'm Dr. Shivika Sethi. I'm a national level faculty for microbiology in India. I'm also the author of the book, review book for microbiology, that is Mastering Microbiology for All PG Entrants and Academics. In this session, we are going to discuss four history-based or clinical case-based MCQs on infectious diseases. We are going to learn how to pick up the catch points so that we can do or pick up our answers quickly and absolutely correctly in our exams. Okay, so without further ado, let's quickly get started. A four year old girl is brought to the pediatrician with a three day history of vomiting and mucus flecked diarrhea. Her parents report that she has had moderate abdominal pain with three to four bouts of vomiting and approximately 10 bowel movements per day and pain on defecation. The patient has reduced urine output. On questioning, she has no history of travel or a change in diet. On examination, she has fever of 38.8, a blood pressure of 110 by 65. Abdominal examination shows normal bowel sounds, no organomegaly, guarding or rebound. Her stool was sent to the laboratory. The guaiac test was positive and three days later, a non-motile H2S negative organism was isolated, which was non-lactose fermenting on McConkie medium. What is the likely etiology? Now, before we read the options, Let's just learn how do we uh, first let's learn to pick up the catch points. Right, so we have a four year old girl. She has blood and mucus in stools. Now, how did we arrive at blood? Because it is mentioned the question that the guaiac test is positive, which is used to detect the presence of occult blood in stools. Okay, so she has mucus and blood in stools, vomiting, pain on defecation. She has reduced urine output, most likely because of the dehydration that she has had because of the vomiting and diarrhea. Otherwise, normal bowel sounds, no organomegaly or guarding or rebound is seen. Okay, so that's the history. Looking at the history, what are we going to think of? It is an invasive diarrhea, blood and mucus in stool in this four-year-old girl with moderate dehydration, okay, along with fever and abdominal cramps, right? So that gives us the diagnosis of invasive cause of diarrhea, plus what are we given that it is the medium is McConkie. So we're going to look for a bacterial cause of invasive diarrhea. Now, which bacterium is it? It is a non-motile H2S negative organism, which is non-lactose fermenting on McConkie medium. Now, McConkie medium tells us that the likely organism is going to be gram negatives because it's a selective medium for gram negative organisms. Now, let's read the options. Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter and Enterotoxigenic E. coli. All these are gram negative bacteria. Now, let's start to rule out the options. ETEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli is a toxin-producing bacterium, labile toxin, stable toxin. This is going to be manifested as watery diarrhea, not blood and mucus in stools. So, we rule this ETEC out. Next option, Campylobacter. Campylobacter requires a special medium to grow. It will never grow directly on McConkie. It's a fastidious bacterium. And anyway, it is a motile bacterium having darting modality or it has low fortricus and amphitricus flagellate, right? So we have eliminated also Campylobacter. Then coming to Shigella. Shigella is a gram-negative bacterium, which is non-lactose fermenting on McConkie. It's one of the non-motile members of Enterobacteriaceae, which is H2S negative. Okay, so this is our likely answer. Let's look at Salmonella. Salmonellas, all of them are motile, except one, which is Gallinarum pullorum. And all Salmonellas are H2S positive. And with, of course, a couple of exceptions are there, 
like typhi suis cholera suis and para typhi a but here we are not talking about because straight away non motile it is and h2s negative so we're going to think eliminate salmonella also from our mind and zero on to our answer shigella right so this is a case of shigellosis or bacillary dysentery so let us quickly go through what are the causes of invasive bacterial diarrhea these are shigella entero invasive e coli entero hemorrhagic e coli non typhoidal salmonella campylobacter species vibrio parahemolyticus and yersinia enterocolitica all these are causes of invasive bacterial diarrhea okay now since we got our answer as the non motile shigella so shigella belongs to the family enterobacteriaceae and which are the five non motile members of enterobacteriaceae family shigella salmonella gallinarum pullorum a typical escherichia coli klebsiella and yersinia pestis these are all non motile less rest all enterobacteria are motile by peritrichus flagellum right so <clears throat> let's quickly go through some important things about shigella which is the cause of bacillary dysentery it's a non motile non capsulated bacterium which is having four species on the basis of the o antigen the somatic antigen that is shigella dysentery flexneri boidi and soniae out of these four species the most severe disease and the species that does not ferment mannitol is shigella dysentery all enterobacteria catalase positive but shigella dysentery if type 1 is catalase negative and it's the only serotype of shigella which produces the shiga toxin the most common cause of shigellosis in india is shigella flexneri and most common species in the world or in the western world is shigella soniae and the only species which is a late lactose fermenting is shigella soniae okay and shigella soniae is the only species of shigella which has only one serotype rest all of them have 6 10 19 serotypes okay let's move on let's quickly go through the important uh, pathogenesis of shigellosis it's an invasive diarrhea and this invasiveness of shigella is due to the presence of a special virulence plasmid which encodes two important virulence factors a type 3 secretion system and invasive plasmid antigens which are also called as virulence marker antigens so shigella can you see in this diagram they are not they are not going to invade from the apical aspect of the colonic or the rectal mucosal cells after being sampled by the microfold cells they are passed on to the underlying macrophages here shigella is going to induce apoptosis of the macrophages and then they are going to invade from the baso lateral aspect using the type 3 secretion system they are going to pump in the epa proteins as a result of which micro spikes will form and they will take up the shigella intracellularly so shigella what is it doing it is it is just provoking its endocytosis by pumping in those epa proteins into the mucosal cells okay then one serotype of shigella that is shigella dysentery type 1 that produces the shiga toxin now this shiga toxin is an a b 5 subunit toxin meaning 1 a 5 b subunits and it this toxins me mechanism of action is basically it inhibits protein synthesis by cleaving the 60s ribosome and its site of action is the endothelial cells and when this shiga toxin disseminates to the glomerulus it precipitates the dreaded complication of hemolytic uremic syndrome now diagnosis of bacillary dysentery 
when we prepare a gram stain smear of the stool sample we are going to see lots of pus cells because it is an invasive diarrhea along with rbcs culture will be done on the selective media like dca xld hea ssa and that is the gold standard and once we have isolated the bacterium by culture we are going to prove its invasive nature by putting up the serine test what is the serine test it is the keratoconjunctivitis that develops in the eye of a guinea pig or a rabbit or we can do invasion of hela or hep2 cell lines to prove its invasive nature we can also do a molecular diagnosis by pcr or nucleic acid probes drug of choice for shigellosis is ciprofloxacin alternatives are ceftriaxone or pivmesilinam right so that's about shigellosis now quick revision of the mekonki medium which is a selective medium for gram negative bacteria to remember the ingredients of mekonki medium we will use the mnemonic p l a n t plus minus c peptone lactose agar neutral red torocolate and c is crystal violet so the bile salts and the crystal violet the sodium torocolate and the crystal violet are the selective agents which are inhibiting the growth of gram positives neutral red is the indicator that's the indicator which is going to change color so when lactose gets fermented acids are produced the neutral red becomes bright pink in color or magenta when the bacterium does not utilize lactose it then utilizes the utilizes the peptone in the medium so no acids are produced the neutral red remains pale in color so lactose fermenting magenta colonies non lactose fermenting pale colonies okay so the sugar present in mekonki medium is the lactose so here is a picture of the colonies when we look at the lactose fermenting members or rather gram negatives the important ones we are going to remember are e coli klebsiella enterobacter and citrobacter right and non lactose fermenting which one will be there salmonella shigella proteus and yersinia so up till now whatever we had talked about all these as well as these four these were all members of enterobacteria which would all grow on mekonki medium then we have two more gram negatives which will easily grow on mac and form nlf colonies that are pseudomonas and vibrio right so mekonki medium which categories of media does it come under it's a mildly selective medium for gram negatives it's an indicator medium and an also it a differential medium right let's take up another question two days after returning from a trip to thailand a 36 year old woman developed severe crampy abdominal pain okay so crampy abdominal pain with fever high grade fever with nausea and malaise the next day she begins to have bloody mucopurulent diarrhea with worsening abdominal pain and continued fever she reports that she was in bangkok during the monsoonal flooding and ate fresh food from the stalls a stool examination shows many neutrophils and culture grows shigella flexneri which of the following statements regarding her clinical syndrome is true okay so what are the highlights crampy abdominal pain high grade fever bloody mucopurulent diarrhea with lots of neutrophils seen on microscopy what's the diagnosis invasive bacterial diarrhea and anyway they have told us that the diagnosis is shigellosis due to shigella flexneri which of the following statements regarding her clinical syndrome is true we have to find out the correct statement an effective vaccine is available for travelers not so there's no vaccine for shigellosis her disease can be distinguished from the illness due to campylobacter jejuni on clinical grounds 
both campylobacter and shigellosis cause invasive bacterial diarrhea both of them manifest with fever abdominal cramps with bloody mucopurulent diarrhea so even this statement becomes incorrect anti motility drugs are effective in reducing the risk of dehydration we do not give anti motility drugs in invasive diarrhea because they can worsen the disease they increase the risk of toxic megacolon and our answer is ciprofloxacin is the recommended therapy for shigellosis we just learned that right so let's move on to our next question a 28 year old man with no significant past medical history arrives at the emergency department complaining of crampy abdominal pain and profuse voluminous bloody diarrhea further history reveals that he has just returned from a camping trip 2 days ago during which he had cooked his own chicken and drank water from a stream okay so bloody diarrhea crampy abdominal pain on physical examination he is febrile and he has diffuse abdominal tenderness which of the following organisms is most likely involved so what are we going to think of again it is an invasive diarrhea abdominal cramps with fever with bloody diarrhea let's read the options <clears throat> bacillus cereus campylobacter jejuni clostridium perfringens enterotoxigenic e coli and vibrio cholerae let's take them up one by one bacillus cereus causes food poisoning both these food poisonings are toxin mediated okay diarrheal type emetic type of food poisoning and these are toxin mediated all associated with either watery diarrhea or nausea and vomiting okay so there is no blood and mucus in stools in this bacillus cereus food poisoning campylobacter jejuni that causes invasive diarrhea and campylobacter jejuni it can be acquired by ingesting poorly cooked meat like here the patient has ingested cooked his own chicken probably this chicken was contaminated and he did not cook it properly because he was camping or possibly he got the infection from the water that he drank from the stream which was contaminated with animal feces okay so okay we can consider this as the diagnosis let's read the other options clostridium perfringens also produces an enterotoxin there is no blood and mucus in stools in that food poisoning also so this is also ruled out enterotoxigenic e coli we just learned also secretes the toxins labile and stable toxins which also cause watery diarrhea so also vibrio cholerae the rice water stools are never blood tinged or anything like that again it's a cholera cholera toxin mediated diarrhea so this is a very simple question to attempt because all the others are toxin mediated diarrheas our answer here is campylobacter jejuni right are we okay with this invasive diarrhea due to campylobacter jejuni now let's quickly go through some important things about campylobacter so campylobacter there are many species which can cause human campylobacteriosis most common species of course is campylobacter jejuni and campylobacter coli so campylobacters these are gram negative bacilli which have a typical morphology they are typically described in the questions as either we are seeing comma shaped bacteria sometimes we can so comma shaped i have marked them out in red can you see this comma shaped then <clears throat> sometimes we can see what are called as gull wing forms you know what are gulls when you see far off in the sky you see far birds like this these are the gull wing forms can you see here i've marked them out or sometimes you can see spiral shaped organisms like this fine so otherwise typically we say campylobacters are gram negative spirals or gram negative comma shaped bacteria which on stool examination may also appear as gull wing forms they have amphitrichous or lophotrichous flagellae they have a darting motility they are catalase and oxidase positive 
they do not utilize sugars and campylobacters are urease negative why i mention urease is because urease is positive for a closely related bacterium which belongs to the same family campylobacteriaceae that is helicobacter that is urease positive right so you can differentiate the two from each other by the urease test now, the medium which is used for growing Campylobacter, it is a fastidious bacterium which requires blood in, or you know, blood agar or chocolate agar to grow, in which we've added a few antibiotics to inhibit the growth of the unwanted bacteria. Just allow Campylobacter to grow. So these media are sclerose medium. That's the most commonly asked medium in our exams, which contains vancomycin, trimethoprim and polymyxin to inhibit the unwanted bacteria other media are butzler medium campy bap medium and cefoperazone vancomycin amphotericin b medium right these are all the four selective media for campylobacter as i mentioned earlier there are 16 campylobacter species most common is campylobacter jejuni meaning cause of human disease now campylobacter jejuni is the sole species of campylobacter for which the optimum temperature of growth is 42 and all campylobacters are micro aerophilic meaning they require about 2 to 8 percent of oxygen to grow so campylobacter this is the disease is a zoonotic disease why because campylobacter species are present as normal gut flora in several animals dogs cats sheep cows etc right even um, birds like hens turkeys so but never present as a normal human flora it's in humans it's going to be pathogenic if it is ingested so food borne it is generally as either food borne or water borne poorly cooked meat or unpasteurized milk or by ingestion of contaminated water which is contaminated with feces of animals or sometimes by direct contact with animals you know while playing with animals so once the bacterium is ingested after an incubation period of say about a week maximum sometimes two to five days or rather broad range two to seven days it is mentioned the patient will come with fever with abdominal cramps sometimes they are so severe they can resemble appendicitis pseudo appendicitis it's also seen in yersinia enterocolitica and yersinia pseudo tuberculosis pseudo appendicitis right and of course we're going to have mucus and blood in stools it's one of the causes of invasive diarrhea two very important complications of campylobacteriosis are reactive arthritis and gain barry syndrome Okay. drug of choice otherwise we generally don't need to give antibiotics because it generally resolves but if the disease is very severe or it persists for more than a week then we will think of giving antibiotics in the form of macrolides <clears throat> let's take up another question a 29 year old reports to the physician due to a two week history of swollen and painful knees and toes he also complains of low back stiffness which is worse in the morning along with these symptoms he also says that he has pain while passing urine okay so he has arthritis low back stiffness painful knees and toes along with these symptoms he also says he has pain while passing urine so he has dysuria clear urethral discharge he also has urethritis for the last one month he also has been in a monogamous relationship with the same person for the last two years on examination you notice conjunctival congestion and on asking the patient the patient says that he has been having redness and watering of both the eyes for the last five to six days vitals are within normal range gram stain of the penile discharge is negative for any organisms 
infection with which of the following is likely in the patient's history right so any guesses what is this this is look at these highlights a young male painful knees and toes with low back stiffness with urethritis dysuria conjunctivitis gram stain is negative let's read the options now borrelia burgdorferi campylobacter neisseria gonorrhoeae or epstein barr virus infection with which is likely can you pick up the triad what is that triad that you can find out in these symptoms the triad is arthritis with urethritis with conjunctivitis what is this this is reactive arthritis so an easy way to remember what are the three components of reactive arthritis cannot pee cannot see cannot climb a tree right so dysuria conjunctivitis with arthritis is reactive arthritis what are the few important causes of reactive arthritis in fact let's start with the most common cause of reactive arthritis chlamydia which causes sexually acquired reactive arthritis that's sara sexually acquired reactive arthritis and what are the other causes these are acquired by gastrointestinal infections shigella campylobacter yersinia enterocolitica and salmonella okay these are the causes of reactive arthritis so the answer that was mentioned in the question was campylobacter so most likely this patient had had a recent gi infection with campylobacter okay so reactive arthritis let's go through some important highlights of this disease also called as post infectious arthritis it was earlier called as reiter's syndrome but people did not like the name reiter's syndrome because this doctor had some close association with hitler so they said let's not remember him we don't want to remember hitler so let's change the name to reactive arthritis so this is a reactive arthritis is a sterile inflammatory spondyloarthropathy which is considered as an autoimmune it's an abnormal immune response query autoimmune which develop which is whose manifestations are seen 1 to 6 weeks after a gastrointestinal or genito urinary infection in about 1% of such cases okay these infections could be either asymptomatic or it could be a mild disease or it could be a severe disease okay so even can follow an asymptomatic infection which could be gi or genito urinary most common age and sex it is seen is young males of course few females also report but mostly predominant cases are of young males especially who have hla b20 who are hla b27 allele positive okay so some people have suggested this allele increases the susceptibility to the disease and some people say it increases the severity of the reactive arthritis okay now so most common symptom of reactive arthritis is the arthritis itself which is a painful asymmetric oligoarthritis most commonly affecting the knees followed by the ankles and the feet joints so in this patient we had the knee joints as well as the ankle joint which was rather not the feet joints were affected along with that in about 50% of cases patients we will have sacroiliitis that is what presents as low back pain and sometimes there is heel pain that occurs because of calcaneal sparring tenosynovitis may also be seen and some people have dactyl dactylitis or sausage digits okay so this arthritis has a remitting relapsing course for 3 to 12 months so after a couple of weeks the patient becomes fine then it has a relapse after a month or so which may last for a variable amount of time right so that's our arthritis most common joints affected knees followed by ankles and feet also associated with the sacroiliitis coming to the urethritis 
this urethritis usually precedes the appearance of the arthritic manifestations as was seen in this patient four week history of the dysuria and the clear urethral discharge this urethritis is usually symptomatic in males right and in females it is generally asymptomatic and manifested by frequency urgency with a clear or a watery urethral discharge okay that is telling us this is not nigeria gonorrhea and that was mentioned in the options gonococcus would be associated with a purulent discharge and typically on gram staining we would see gram negative diplococci inside and outside macrophages okay and urine stain or urine culture is typically negative it's an inflammatory it's an abnormal immune response the, everything is going to be sterile the joint fluid uh, the synovial fluid is going to be sterile the urine culture is going to be sterile along with the urethritis there may be prostatitis in females it may also lead to cervicitis salpingitis and vulvovaginitis coming to the third manifestation that is conjunctivitis which is generally bilateral and short lasting patient will have complaints of redness or crusting of the eyes especially when he gets up in the morning and sometimes associated with the conjunctivitis the patient may present with acute anterior usually unilateral uveitis so here what will be mentioned that the patient has blurring of vision or photophobia right so that's our three components of the reactive arthritis sometimes i'm just talking some more manifestations of the same disease in 50% of cases sometimes on the palms and the soles the patient may have waxy or red nodules which gradually spread over the whole palms and soles and they merge or coalesce with each other that manifestation is called as keratoderma blenorrhagia and in about 25 to 40% of patient the patient may also have sarcinate balanitis okay right so this brings us to the end of our uh, question uh, discussion on this uh, campylobacter and shigella so i'm just quickly going through the important points here 29 year old man with painful knees and toes clear uh, low back stiffness clear urethral discharge conjunctivitis gram stain is negative the urethral discharge was clear so that rules out nigeria gonorrhea because nigeria gonorrhea would be associated with uh, purulent discharge some of you might think yes it could be gonococcus because it would present as urethral discharge with of course when it becomes a disseminated gonococcemia it can manifest as the arthritis but in that case the discharge will be purulent and the staining would not be negative we would see the gram negative diplococci campylobacter is our answer epstein barr virus has has no association with reactive arthritis borrelia burgdorf ferry <clears throat> yes this causes lyme's disease whose manifestation is arthritis but that would not have any association with the conjunctivitis or the urethritis so that brings us to the end of today's session see you in the next one